My relationship with table RPGs have always been a good reflection of where I am mentally and emotionally as a person. Not even a year ago, I would try to run pay-to-play games and join pay-to-play games. Basically, in a bad situation where I wanted to lean into a hobby and an art form I really enjoyed, and thought it was good enough to earn some money to help me get through those tough times. And while mostly I was good enough, there were unfortunately aspects of my GMing and my playing that had a lot to be desired. Mostly in just expectation. I expected way too much out of the GM I was paying for, and then out of myself. Never really being able to hit the highs that I really wanted with the story. Things were too slow, things were too half-baked and half-built, and I was investing so much of myself into these stories that I just demanded more. I became, well, for lack of a better word, a toxic person because of it. Some people had to cut me out, rightfully so, and I will always be apologetic for that. Others, generally the players I was running the game for, I was able to find a middle ground and simply tell them that, hey, we are going to do this one or two last sessions, and then we're going to wrap up because I can't do this anymore. Realistically, that came from just real life and me needing to focus on my day job, but it was a great excuse to get out of what I was not being emotionally, creatively, or mentally satisfied with. So, some time passes, and I start to get back into TRPGs. Specifically, thanks to the Mythic GM Emulator. Reading this book, trying out the rule sets and the tables and the dice rolls had fully helped me understand where my mentality for TRPGs had been so wrong. Now, before I go any further, this is purely subjective and my own experience. I'm not saying that the way you run your tables is bad or even that you're doing things the wrong way because you're doing a more traditional setup with one person being the storyteller or the GM and the others being the players. There's no one way to run these games or enjoy them. If anything, the GM emulator in its own way of writing, thanks to the authors, have already shown that there's so many ways just to use this book alone, let alone play the actual games you're running. There's just simply no one, wrong, no one way to have fun, and there's no wrong way to enjoy your games as long as everyone at the table is enjoying themselves and no one's actually getting hurt. So, after kind of revealing my heart a little bit, and explaining to you a little bit of where I'm coming from when I got this book, let me tell you about it. The Mythic GM Emulator is a sequel to a book that created a means of playing the game by yourself. Which you might think is kind of weird, this is supposed to be a team-orientated game. But in truth, it became a very fun way to practice roleplay and team comps and really being able to understand a game you were playing because you had all these different tables and all these different combinations of dice rolls to help inspire you for a new story. The emulator is not a means of replacing people, it just simply takes some of the power away from the GM, thus some of the responsibility, and gives it more to the players so everyone is more actively involved in the storytelling. Or if you're playing by yourself, it just lets you not feel like you have to entertain anyone but yourself, and you can practice some classes you may never have been able to do before. The second edition is just purely better in every single way. And it's not just me who thinks that obviously the author has that, but there is a tidbit where the author seems to really express that while the first book was a great step forward, there's been a lot of playtesting, there's been a lot of comments, and there's been a lot of new methodologies of how games work where we were able to take another step beyond what the first edition gave us. Not to mention giving us a heck of a lot more options and a standard for how some of these dice rolls go. Honestly, everyone involved in this book deserves to get applauded because you've created a tool that anyone can use in almost any way. But enough of a fluff piece, let me actually explain how this works. Let's say you have yourself, a GM, and two other players. We'll go GM, player one, player two. 
As the GM, even though in this scenario you're still going to play the game yourself, you also express that you want to help run it and you want to help make the story go on. For this scenario, we're going to assume we're playing Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Do not worry, you don't have to know a thing about Pathfinder. Just understand that we have a game in mind. The emulator is not the game, though it could be. It is the addition to add to Pathfinder. You, you, you could substitute any other RPG here. We ask as the GM to player one, what kind of adventure do you want this to be? Right off the bat, swashbuckling, pirate adventures, high seas stakes, lots of combat, lots of fun with the way that you can uh, recruit different pirates and different crews and all sorts of treasure hunting, really going up against the law. Player two, not entirely against that, but wanting a little bit more roleplay mixed in with everything. Wanting maybe to take more of an espionage route and do a little bit more political intrigue and talking with really important characters. So with both of that in kind of an agreement and us, the GM, not really minding either option, we then ask, all right, cool, where are we starting? At a fancy political gala? trying to find information about a massive treasure or some kind of new adventure for our crew to go on? Or are we already in the midst of a gunfight or in the middle of a ship battle trying to survive as we're about to be just blown to smithereens? Both players can't decide which they want more. So, it's time to roll some Fate Dice. Fate Dice is in general the system we're going to use to help make decisions, help add different prompts and words to how we're going to get the story moving. So in this case, generally speaking, you're going to have what's called a chaos factor. The easiest way to explain this before just, you know, convincing you to buy the book is see the chaos factor as something that is goes up or down dependent on how much control the party has in the scenario we're in. So if we were already in this firefight on the seas, the chaos factor would go up one because we have less control. The chaoticness of this world is becoming stronger. What that implies is that more questions are going to be asked and are going to be answered yes. Why is that important? Hang in there, we'll get there. The other thing you have to keep in mind is that no matter what questions you ask, you're going to assume that the answer you're aiming for, or the answer that is, you, the way you ask it, essentially, is a yes. For example, uh, you want to go to a restaurant and you want to have a ham and cheese sandwich. Does the restaurant have cheese? Well, you really want that cheese, so you're gonna say, I'm gonna say yes, I would like for this place to have cheese. You think it's likely that they have cheese, you roll dice, and there you go. The reverse of that is, oh no, I hope they don't have cheese. I'm horribly allergic to it. The question is still, do they have cheese? It doesn't matter if it's in your favor or not. The question is, is the thing going to happen? You generally want to ask more yes or no questions that are a little bit more neutral when asking. If you try to ask a question that leans more towards your favor, it can get a little muddy, but that's where the second aspect of this comes into. And that's where the chaos factor essentially plays. Once a question is asked, everyone at the table generally tries to come to a consensus of if it's likely or not likely that something's going to happen. And there are varying degrees of likelihood. There, Likely, very likely, probable, or it's, it's gonna happen. Unlikely, completely the same reversed, and you get a plus one through five depending on how likely you think it is. The chaos factor will affect that as well. So in this scenario, the chaos factor is a five. We're just starting, there's no modifier, no plus. And since both players want something completely different out of the beginning of this adventure, they're going to say that there is no other yes or no to this. It's a 50-50 shot, whatever happens. You roll 2d10, and you get a 10, meaning no. Based off of one of the charts on the book, getting a 10 or lower means that it's a no. Well, that's unfortunate. That means while we can be in this setting of swashbuckling pirates, we're not currently in the midst of a battle. And because it's a 10 and it's not under the chaos factor, which is a five, we can continue on. Nothing's going to happen. And don't worry, I will explain soon what happens when it does fall under the chaos factor. But for now, we ask the next question. Okay, 
So we're not in a massive battle. We're not on a ship. Are we in the middle of that gala? Are we trying to sneak around and essentially make good conversation and connections with the rich? Roll 2d10. 12. Like, that's a yes. With the likelihood still being 50-50 and the chaos factor having no say in this yet, it was purely down to the dice. We are in a scene of espionage and political intrigue. Okay, the uh, player one's not entirely up for this, but you know, they still get their swashbuckling adventure. So the party goes off. We start to discover what kinds of people are going to be there. Now, without getting too lost for the forest and the trees, I will simply say that the GM emulator has multiple tables, multiple different word pairings where you can roll a couple of D100s and get descriptions and idea prompts for multiple characters. We're not going to go into that, but at this point in the story, you'd start asking more questions. You'd see what different royals are there, what their personalities are, what their motives are, how we can discover those motives. You're generally looking to add more to the story by getting more details. But for now, let's play with the scenario that after a little bit of doing some fun with the gala and going on, we've made a couple of friends, but there's one individual who's just a little suspect. We don't really know what's going on with that. Now, we've been using some of the Pathfinder rules to sneak, to deceive, to discuss, to diplomacy, and maybe even to do a little bit of stealing itself. But one of us happens to catch out of the corner of our eye something that's not supposed to be there. We've already done all everything we need to do. We've talked to everyone. There's nothing else we can think to do. And then something catches our eye. It's time to check the scene. Another D10. Well, this fell under the Chaos Factor. It's a four. Well, a four means that it is an altered scene. Go to another table. We roll another d10, remove a character. One of the nobles we just talked to is killed. We saw it, a glint from a sniper's scope. One of the players immediately brings up them. That's the rival pirate gang that we were talking about earlier. They've come to try and frame us for something. Everyone kind of freezes and thinks, well, that makes sense, but hold on. Is it really that pirate gang? Roll the fate dice. 18. Exceptional. Yes, it is the rival pirate gang. But then the next question comes in. Did the Duke live? Did that shot kill them? This is where it gets interesting. Because now we have to ask the right question. I mentioned before you want to try and have as neutral of yes or no questions as you can control. In this scenario, can't really be helped. So the party agrees, listen, that kind of a sneaky shot, it's more likely that the guy's going to be dead. So the real question is, are they alive? So are is the Duke alive? We roll the dice? No. In fact, it's a three. Chaos factors at a five. And that means we're going to get another interrupted scene. An interrupted scene means that some randomness is going to happen. We pull out some new tables from the book. We roll a d100. Remove an object. Something PC negative. A high roll on the d100. Due to the situation at hand, the Duke is dead. The Royal has been slain. And we're to blame. PC negative. Immediately, it comes to our minds. Why would the rival pirate gang want to do this? Why here? Why now? because they know that we're trying to parlay for our freedom, make deals with the upper crust, really prove that our pirate gang is something to be trusted. And maybe we are. Maybe we are outlaws, but we're honorable ones. But now we're going to have to prove it, because now a noble is dead, a shot was fired, and the only known pirates on the island is us. At this point, you would walk away from the GM emulator, and everyone would take a break, or the GM would have shown that, hey, I had a battle uh, prepared for this. I just didn't know how the interconnected pieces were going to happen yet. And you go on. You do the battle. You continue the story. And then you're off. This is where the example would have to end because there's so many other turnabouts and twists and insanity you could take. However, one thing I would add is that since all this is happening, since things have gotten so out of control and not of our own choice, the chaos factor would go up six meaning a modifier of plus one 
meaning every fate question that is asked from here on until that goes back down gets an automatic one to every potential yes question, good or bad. The fun of this concept, I hope I've been able to explain, is that a GM is able to do as much prep work as they want, even get involved in the story as much as they want, because they don't know what's going to happen. They don't know what's there. Hap we don't know. But it allows the players to also tell the story going forward. You can prepare as many NPCs, as much of the battle, as much of the map as you'd like. Or if you are more improv focused, you can have a couple of things prepared, have an idea of where the story's going to go, but you want to see what the players and the group can come up with. What insanity will come together through just telling them, you're on a boat, what are you doing? And that's always been the fun of TRPGs. Just, you're in a location, this is what you see, what do you do? But now... For someone like me, who gets way too caught up in trying to come up with a million different answers and ways to, one, keep the players on track, and two, cater to what they're trying to do, I don't have to choose between them. If I personally set up a villain and a battle, it doesn't matter where I place it, I just have to make sure we get there. If the players end up going on a completely different side tangent, and I didn't prepare for it, let's well, fine. All I prepared for was, here's our goal, here's the thing we want to fight, how do we get there? And asking your players how we get there, but you know, more creatively, like I showed before, is the whole fun of seeing where this goes. Now, I implied that as a GM, you would be a player as well, and in the example I gave, it works because you don't entirely know how this is going to go down or where this is going to go. But if you don't want to be the GM who puts their player in there, doesn't want to have a character, you can still use these methods as a GM. Just ask the questions, prod your players, see where it's going, and have some level of prep done. Maybe less or more than you normally would, but now you can rely on the book and the words and your players to take the story and directions rather than having to rely only on yourself. Now, players won't feel as discouraged for just having to sit on their hands and not do anything and not partake because it's not their scene. It's not the part of the story they care about. The, anything could happen if you just let these dice and your players help tell the story. That way, in a lot of stories where things just aren't as engaging for everyone, including you, the GM, anything could happen. Now, if you're not wanting to use this so lively right off the bat, you can use any of these tables as a method of creating a storyline or prepping yourself. I'm sure there are several GMs out there who are sitting down trying to scroll through monster lists or scroll through Reddit or even just scroll through different story prompts on a fanfiction website, trying to get some kind of inspiration for what are we going to do this week? What's the adventure? I can't think of anything. Roll a couple of D100s for an adventure theme. Roll a couple of dice to figure out what your characters are looking for, what MacGuffin thing it does. Roll a couple of dice to give you descriptive words for characters, whether it be an old hag with a foot fungus or a beautiful prince who also is secretly a devil. The sky's the limit because you have a tool and a prompt to work with. You can use the Mythic GM emulator as much as you want and plug it into your game as necessary as possible. And some games just aren't going to work with this. A buddy of mine pointed out that Blades in the Dark is a very reactive storytelling kind of game. It's not very crunchy when it comes to the actual combat, which is fine. It, that's basically using, from what I understand, the same methodology and even some of the same ideas as the Mythic system to tell its story. So you're already kind of knowing what's going on by using it. Whether you're a GM trying to tell a story and just need new fresh ideas and you just need something to get those gears turning, or you're a GM or a player who just wants a couple of buddies together and see what the hell happens. You don't prepare anything, maybe only a, a single combat, and who knows what happens? It becomes a game again. It becomes a story that doesn't feel as forced and doesn't feel so beholden to your creative spark. And everyone gets involved. If I had been running games more like this, even just for free, probably especially for free, because I can't, I, I don't think I could justify or see myself paying people to do this. 
but that would be okay because everyone would be having a good time. Everyone would be getting involved. Everyone would have something to say and could be inspired just from a dice roll telling you, yes, you jumped over the dragon or no, you didn't get out of the cave collapse in time. You never know what's going to happen. And that's the fun of it. This book, The Mythic System, saved my love of TRPGs and made me reflect on the kind of person, game runner, and player that I was. And that I am now. To those people that whose time and patience and energy I wasted, I'm sorry. There's no excuse for who I was. And this book didn't make me a better person. It just came into my life when I was ready to start being better. And if that very dorky, heartfelt sentiment does anything for you, I hope it's enough to have you look at this book and implement some of the ideas to make your games better. It's a tool, and you might not find any use out of this. Maybe it's just a fun little read for you. There is no wrong way to play, but I think you'd be missing out if you didn't give this a shot. My name's Basil, not The Herb. I stream on Twitch. I play everything from fantasy games to co-op games to even running a couple of TRPGs just for the hell of it. If you want to follow me on here or at Twitch or any of my socials or even jump in my Discord, I welcome you with open arms and I hope we get to all have fun playing games together. See you next time.